Okay, now we're ready to go. So welcome everyone to the first okay, talk. Okay, great. And uh, uh, I could introduce Lucas, but I won't because it will take a while. Uh, I'll just let him get straight into it. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, thanks. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining me here in the uh, music department, home of the ejector chair, which I encourage you all to try if you haven't tried it already. Um, I am going to be reading to you today uh, from a book that I'm working on that is due on June 15th of this year. So I am, uh, oh, sorry, June 15th of last year. So I'm a little bit behind on it. Um, and uh, you'll probably know why once I read it, but uh, I'm, I'm almost finished with it. And I'm adhering to the maxim of, uh, of David Sedaris, who says to never read what is out, always read what you're working on so that you can get an audience reaction. So I am looking for uh, feedback. Does this make any sense? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I apologize if it doesn't, but I think it more or less does. Um, what you need to know, I'm going to be reading, reading the introduction, and then I'm going to just jump into what is like a middle chapter. And um, when I get to that middle chapter, what you need to know is that um, Hans Zimmer is a film composer who you may have heard of. Uh, if you haven't heard of him, you certainly know his work. He did Batman, uh, Inception, et cetera, et cetera. Big, huge uh, Hollywood movies. And I used to work for him, and he, um, he has a big sort of complex that hires hundreds of composers. Uh, and I was one of them for a time, so that's um, what I'm writing about. And I was working for one of his minions named Michael Levine. I think that's all the background you need. Uh, I'll just jump into it, and um, all right, here we go. So this is from my book, which is currently entitled The Music Code. That may or may not change. We will find out. Uh, the Lakota language has no nouns. In fact, it has no parts of speech other than what we would call verbs. This language, according to Teokas and Ghost Horse, does not regard time or space the way we in English and Romance languages do. In Lakota, everything is always happening. Teokasin's way of seeing the world is fundamentally different from my own, but we've been friends for 20 years and we can play meaningful and engaging music together. I've always thought that Teokasin was just a normal guy who saw the world the same way that I did, and that his musings about the Lakota language were not literally true, but simply a way for him to connect with his heritage. These musings, also had the these musings also had the pleasant benefit of being entertaining to an audience of mostly Western people in the mood for something exotic and beautiful, even if it came with a bit of ancestral guilt. Our performances would begin with Teokasin in full regalia, explaining the meaning of his name and speaking in Lakota to an audience of usually white haired museum patrons. Then we'd improvise for sometimes as long as an hour. The concerts had an air of sacrament about them. Teokasin's regalia and his hypnotic voice speaking in Lakota, his very presence positioned the audience perfectly for something otherworldly. Offstage, Teokasin is a scholar. When we're deep in discussion, he'll sometimes pause in mid-sentence and say that English is a prison or that the specific idea can be expressed in a single phrase in Lakota, but would take hours to explain in English. How do I as a monoglot respond to that? If English is a prison, then I'm stuck in this prison with no hope of ever getting out. But I can't verify this. I don't speak Lakota, and according to Teokasin, it's not possible for me to learn. It has to be learned on the Lakota land with the Lakota people in one's youth. So I'm doomed to live in a reality that I can only partially understand, while there are people like Teokasin around me that have different and perhaps fuller understandings of the workings of the universe. That's pretty bitter medicine, but how could it be otherwise? All of our minds, including Teokasin's, are prisons from which we can never escape. Of course, we privilege our own viewpoints and our own cultures, but other cultures and viewpoints exist, and we can't know them all. Each culture understands the complexity of the universe in its own unique and incomplete way. When Teokasin and I first started playing music together, I was most impressed by his flutes. He makes each of them himself from wood he gathers on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, USA. Teokasin's flutes are made to be the length of his arm, and the distance between the holes are some variation the widths of his fingers. Each one has a unique song. Each one has a unique shape, but they produce tones in an order that is easily represented in Western music. They all play what Westerns would recognize as scales and to music-minded Westerners, pentatonic scales. Teokasin doesn't know about scales or keys or harmony when he plays. He doesn't think about scales or keys or harmony when he plays, but he knows how to make uh, the flute sound beautiful. 
I was in music school when we were working in a band together and all the latest avant-garde music theory was fresh in my mind. I could recognize a scale that Teokasen was playing and then use an unexpected harmony to make it sound any way I wanted. Teokasen would react musically to these changes and I would react to his reactions. We were communicating in two completely different languages, each manipulating sound with no common intellectual understanding of what the other was doing. But the result was very pleasing to the ears of us and our audience. We speak different languages, languages so different that our comprehension of the task we were engaged in together was represented by non-compatible models of the very nature of reality. Still, the medium of sound made these languages mutually intelligible. We make music that is understood by our audience, sometimes without understanding it ourselves. If Teokasen understands what I do only through his lens, and I understand what he does only through mine, is it a leap to imagine music created by a performer that understands nothing and simply executes some notes and sonorities in an order that it has learned will please an audience? Music is shaped by feedback. We learn what works and we keep doing it. We don't need to know, and many of us don't care why it works, but if an audience responds to something and then a different audience responds to the same thing, we start to realize that whatever we're doing is eliciting the desired response and we keep it in the show. This is what we perceive as experience or wisdom or showmanship, but it's really just trial and error. An artificial intelligence running a long short-term memory or LSTM, which I don't have to explain to this crowd, uh, the kind I used to finish Schubert's Unfinished Symphony with AI on a Huawei mobile phone works exactly the same way. It tries options, receives feedback from the programmer, gradually learning as it collects his feedback. The AI's model of the universe is different from mine and it's different from Teokasen's. In English, things happen, happened, are happening, or will happen. Got that right? Uh, in Lakota, things are always happening. To an AI, time is not relevant at all. The AI exists in a universe of complete abstraction where the base layer of reality is binary code existing as electric charges on a silicon chip. But still, it can make music. It can learn to perform for us in the sense that it will generate music that we find acceptable. To call a piece of music acceptable is hardly an inspiring description, but no other human, but no other non-human that we know of is capable of making music at all. Acceptable music is actually a huge leap. If we human performers, if we human performers are just taking cues from the audience, like an LSTM takes cues, if we, sorry, if we human performers are just taking cues from an audience, like an LSTM takes cues from a performer, how are we able to imbue the music we create with meaning? The fact that an AI can make music that will move and inspire you, and that is a fact, has not so much to do with the AI as with the humans with which it interacts. AI music and AI in general are not the end of music or the apotheosis of human creativity and technological growth, but simply the latest in a long line of revolutionary technologies that have changed mankind and her arts forever. This makes perfect and intuitive sense to Teokasen, but in our English prison, it requires further explanation. So now I'm gonna to skip to um, working for Hans Zimmer. It is now 10 years later. Doesn't really matter. Can I just ask a to question a composer. before we go on, Lucas? Yeah, yeah, of course. Please. Why, yeah. why does it make sense to Teokasen? Why does music make sense to Teokasen? No, oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Your um, last statement. I mean, you, yeah, I sense. understand. I know. I, under, uh, I mean, I, I the like Teokasen's model of the world is of something always changing and nothing ever remaining static. Um, uh, okay. And so the idea that like AI is something that is just, you know, a thing along the way to other things is just how he sees the universe um, okay. rather than like, he doesn't see anything as existing other than moving towards something else. Um, uh -huh. But that's a good note. And I'm going to uh, write that down as I'm reading this. I'm realizing that there's some stuff I want to change. Oh, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for being my guinea pigs. So I guess that's uh, a, it's a similar response to well, the way his music is different then. I don't really know. Um, I don't really know. Like, I mean, I, I can't because of the, language barrier and because he doesn't really understand music in any uh he, he's not able to abstract it in any way that makes sense to a westerner i really have no idea how he sees music i just know that he makes sounds and i know what sounds like i know what to do with those sounds that's really it so he has no idea what i'm doing i mean i try to talk to him about harmony and he has no idea what i'm talking about 
and he tries to talk to me about his, you know, making it the kind of melody that would summon a deer on a cloudy day, and that, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so, but together we're able to make music that is uh, is perfectly intelligible and fun. We both seem to know when it sounds good. So, so something's communicated, but I'm not I'm not sure if it's uh, abstractable, and that's that's kind of the point. Um, so, if that wasn't clear, I'll make that clearer. Uh, all right, I'm going to continue. Uh, to a composer of just uh, to a composer of just 50 years ago, virtual instruments on a digital audio workstation represent unimaginable power. The power to use and manipulate any sound, and the power to create new sounds without relying on musicians or recording studios. Virtual instruments give the composer power to hear, not just to imagine what something will sound like. Of course, there's a dark side. Virtual instruments are often very large files, and opening any large file on a computer takes time. A virtual instrument takes a relatively long time to reload, and that can be, and that that load time can interrupt the flow of creativity. It's easy to brush this off and say that loading virtual instruments might take 15 seconds, while arranging for a musician to come and play something would take at least a few hours. This seems like a perfectly rational argument, but in the midst of creativity, time works differently. Time lost in the creative process does not have the same value as time lost during administrative tasks. When engaged in any kind of creativity, interruptions are like an opened door and your ideas are like a little cat will bolt out of the room at the slightest provocation. Studies of creative people at work show that it can take as much as 20 minutes to get back into the flow of creative work after an interruption. Even a minor interruption like hearing an email notification can take 20 minutes to fully recover from. So, while virtual instrument technology makes a task that used to take a few hours, take a few seconds, when that few second interruption occurs, makes it a real problem. For a composer working with manuscript paper and pencil, the limit to what they can co compose is only their imagination. While the limits of a composer working with a DAW are what samples that computer has available and loaded. A computer in 2013 could only load about 50 virtual instruments at one time. A composer may need hundreds of virtual instruments for any given project. So how would you solve, how would you in 2013 solve the problem of needing to have access to several hundred virtual instruments at once? While you think about that, let me tell you about Thuth, one of uh, Professor Murphy's favorite subjects. In Plato's Phaedrus, Socrates tells a story about the invention of writing. Writing was first given to the Egyptians, he says, by Thuth, the god of technology. Thuth introduced this invention to the Egyptian king Thanos, saying, O oh, king, here is something that once learned will make Egyptians wiser and will, will improve their memory. I have discovered a potion for memory and for wisdom. Thanos, a wise king, replied by telling Thuth that one man can give birth to the elements of an art, but only another can judge how they can benefit or harm those who will use them. And now, since you are the father of writing, your affection for it has made you describe its effects as the opposite of what they really are. In fact, it will induce forgetfulness into the soul of those who learn it. They will not practice their memory because they will put their trust in writing, which is external and depends on signs that belong to others, instead of trying to remember from the inside completely on their own. You have not discovered a potion for remembering, but a potion for reminding. You provide your students with the appearance of wisdom, not with its reality. Thuth, who here represents the idea of technological progress, always exacts a toll for his inventions, even if he doesn't know it. In the case of writing, in, in this case, writing comes at the cost of memory. Perhaps this seemed like a profound loss to a preliterate king, but the technology of writing is one of the foundations of civilization. So whatever benefits of memory we gave up by relying on writing are probably worth it. The king also suggests that people who don't learn in the old fashioned way, in this case by memorization, can never achieve wisdom and will only achieve the appearance of wisdom. This argument is as forceful today as it was in Plato's time, and it's equally fallacious. Wisdom generally comes with age. Those who learned the old ways, it hardly needs to be stated, are old. They are likely to be wiser than those schooled in whatever the new technology is, but not by virtue of their education, but by virtue of their long experience. What's new to us today will be ancient history to our children. The next generation will encounter the same dynamic as they age, and this will go on forever. This is just part of being human. We'll learn later about a medieval monk, <laughs> monk, about a medieval monk who devised a system for writing music down. 
He was almost excommunicated for doing this. The way that monks learned music was by a course of memorization that took about 10 years. Suddenly through musical notation, it was possible to learn how to read music and then read any of the songs a singer would need to know the moment that he needed to know them. How would you feel if you had spent 10 years learning something and at the end of the decade long apprenticeship, someone devised a way to learn the same thing in a few months? You probably feel like there was some intangible benefit to having learned the old fashioned way because it's easier to believe that than to believe that technology has made the education you've already received obsolete. Your belief would be bolstered by the fact that those who learned the same way you did are better at the skill in question, but they're likely better at it because they've been doing it longer, not because they've learned it the old fashioned way. This fallacious idea that the old ways are always better is expressed among scientists with the dark aphorism, scientific progress happens one funeral at a time. Booth and Socrates have a lot to teach us about the dangers and benefits of technology, namely that there's a trade-off between, huh, namely that there's a trade-off between new technology and time-tempered wisdom. We have to decide with each new technological advance if the human wisdom it costs is worth the benefit it bestows. Sometimes it is, like in the case of writing, and sometimes it isn't. But let's get back to how Hans Zimmer solved the problem of loading hundreds of instruments with limited processing power in order to minimize interruptions. Hans came up with an ingenious method to keep the creative flow going. He built his own novel musical instrument. The solution to this problem of lost flow, when I was working at remote control, was to network many, as many as a dozen computers together and keep all of the virtual instruments loaded on the external computers all of the time. This is why Michael's studio at remote control uh, had a machine room with nine computers in it. Hans and everyone who worked for him had a tiny private internet of sounds attached to their digital audio workstation. This solution was expensive and complicated and had the side effect of forcing composers to understand the details of computer networking. These private internets of sounds are all unique and specific to each composer. The composer's internet of sounds is, a, and this is the tool she uses to write and produce music. Is, uh, sorry, the composer's, a composer's internet of sounds the tool she uses to write and produce music is simply called a rig. A musical instrument is defined as an object for producing musical sounds. So it is not a stretch to say that each rig that a composer creates is a unique musical instrument. Like the musician who made the first bone flute 43,000 years ago, or my friend Tiokasen, Ghost Horse, today's composers take the available technology and repurpose it to make music. The 43,000 year old bone flute existed in an era when not all humans were sapiens. So this practice of making instruments is probably older than humanity itself. Since the time of the bone flute, Western music has spent thousands of years atomizing and specializing. Over time, artisans began to create instruments for specialists to play. This kind of specialization, an instrument maker who is not the player of their instruments that they make, is a relatively new concept. It's only possible in large scale societies that have commerce. An individual can carve a flute from a bone without taking much, too much time away from hunting and gathering but a nomadic hunter-gatherer cannot make a piano. The complexity of an instrument and the skills needed to manufacture it reveal a lot about the society into which it was born. Flutes like the bone flute and drums sounded good in the forest or on the steppe lands where our nomadic ancestors lived, and they were portable. A harp sounds good in angular cavernous stone rooms and requires specialized workers to produce. It came to prominence in Mesopotamia and Greece with the rise of cities and ziggurats. The large male choir sounds amazing in cathedrals and requires a dedicated class of singers to maintain the repertoire via oral tradition. It came to prominence in the medieval period when the church could support monks in such endeavors. Modern orchestras require teams of instrument makers and musicians and dedicated buildings. A novel system of abstraction like the musical notation and it requires modern commerce. It began in earnest during the Renaissance when all of these things came together. Today, a single composer can use technology developed by thousands of people over thousands of careers to produce music entirely by themselves. What does the rig say about our society? Taking this broad historical view, Western music has never been as close to the true roots of how and why music was made than we are today. Our tribe is bigger, our raw materials are more complex, but we are the same human musicians we've always been. A composer and their rig may be the ultimate synthesis of technology and art. This is why technology does not scare me as a musician. It fascinates me and I believe it empowers me. That's the end of my excerpt. Thank you for listening.